All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started and we'll let the stragglers come in when they're ready. So good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust, and the UNESCO Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust, I would like to welcome you to this event. My name is Dr. Stacy Gallen, and I am the founding director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust, the co-chair of the UNESCO Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust, which falls under the UNESCO Chair of Bioethics in Haifa, and the director of the Center for Human Dignity in Bioethics, Medicine, and Health at Misericordia University. That's all quite a mouthful, so. Remember the past, protect the future. This is not only the motto of the Maimonides Institute, but also the theme that permeates all of our programming. It is especially important today on the anniversary of Kristallnacht that we take the time to remember the past. However, traditional Holocaust education has often focused on the past and the importance of the Holocaust as a historical event to the exclusion of discussing the present and the future. As any historian will tell you, understanding the past is key to ensuring that it never repeats itself. So tonight, we will be discussing the past by exploring the ways in which the medical community systematically participated in the labeling, persecution, and eventual mass murder of millions of innocent victims during the Holocaust. We will reflect on the experiences of those whose lives were changed irrevocably at the hands of Nazi medicine. These stories, this history, is the foundation that our work is built upon. That being said, Mima believes that we have a responsibility to go further. One of the most important challenges we face is how to transcend the traditional boundaries that have long plagued Holocaust education. How do we reach non-traditional audiences? How do we bridge the generational, religious, professional, and geographic gaps so that we can make sure that the world never forgets what took place in Nazi Germany? The answer to that question lies in looking not only at the past, but at the present and the future as well. When the Nuremberg Code was announced, American physicians and scholars felt that this code was not applicable to them. It was a good code for barbarians, but an unnecessary code for ordinary physician scientists. Yet, as we have now come to realize, this quote was uttered right in the middle of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, in which the United States Public Health Service attempted to understand the trajectory of syphilis in African American males without obtaining anything even resembling informed consent or providing adequate treatment for the disease once it became available. Clearly, a code of ethics emphasizing the voluntary informed consent of the individual is something that was, in fact, very necessary not just in post-war Germany, but all over the world. The relevance of the doctor's trial and the publication of the Nuremberg Code for the ethical practice of medicine, the creation of healthcare policy, and the protection of human rights may not have been widely apparent then, but looking back now, it seems fairly obvious that it should have been. 70 years after the doctor's trial and the publication of the Nuremberg Code, are we really any more informed about the ways in which the medical community participated in the only example of medically sanctioned genocide in history? Are we familiar with the ethical implications of the medical transgressions that took place during the Holocaust for modern scientific theory, medical practice, healthcare policy, and human rights endeavors? Have we learned from history so that we can confidently state that it will not repeat itself? These are the questions that we will be asking this evening. Raising awareness about this topic and finding ways to incorporate it into current discussions within healthcare and bioethics are the goals of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust, as well as the UNESCO Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust. And we are extremely proud to partner with the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, to bring you this program tonight. Before I turn things over to Dr. Tessa Shalouche, I wanna just let you know what the schedule will look like for this evening. Dr. Shalouche will provide an introductory lecture on the topic of bioethics in the Holocaust that will serve as an educational primer for the discussion that we will follow, that will follow. 
We'll then do um, what my colleague uh, referred to as a seventh inning stretch, so everybody can stand up and take a breath and, um, you know, just kind of make yourselves a little bit more comfortable. Uh, before we begin a panel conversation, which features internationally recognized scholars in the fields of Holocaust education, global healthcare policy, bioethics, psychology, and medicine. While there will not be a formal question and answer session due to time constraints, we will have time for informal conversation and refreshments at the conclusion of the panel. And I encourage all of you to approach our panelists and engage them in conversation. They're very nice people. They're very smart, but they're very approachable, I promise. Um, and they are more than happy to answer your questions and talk to you as this is something that they're all very passionate about. So at this point, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Tessa Shalouche. Dr. Shalouche is here all the way from Israel, where she is a family physician. Dr. Shalouche was born in South Africa and made Aliyah to Israel in 1977. So just as a warning, her accent is fantastic because it's a combination of South African and Israeli. So really, as I always tell her, she could just read the phone book and everybody would be very happy. Dr. Shalouche graduated from the Sackler School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University Medical School in 1984. She subsequently specialized in family medicine at Tel Aviv University and has been practicing as the Director of Primary Medical Care Practices since 1987. She teaches family medicine residents for the Family Medicine Program at Tel Aviv University. For the past 17 years, Dr. Shalouche has been teaching and lecturing on the subject of medicine and the Holocaust. She has published numerous articles on the subject in international medical and law peer-reviewed journals and has presented many, many lectures at national and international medical conferences and medical schools on various aspects of the involvement of medicine in the Third Reich. Dr. Shalouche has participated in conferences involving major Holocaust memorial institutions in Israel and throughout the world. Since 2004, Dr. Shalouche has been a lecturer and co-director for an annual undergraduate course on medicine and the Holocaust for second to third year medical students at the Technion Institute Medical School in Haifa. In 2013, Dr. Shalouche co-edited the publication of the casebook on bioethics in the Holocaust, which was published under the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics in Haifa. Dr. Shalouche firmly believes in the promotion of medicine and the Holocaust as an academic discipline in medical centers throughout the world. She's affiliated with the International Center for Medicine, Law, and Ethics at Haifa University. Since 2015, Dr. Shalouche has been the co-director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. In 2017, Dr. Shalouche and I were fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to start the Department for Medicine and the Holocaust as part of the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics in Haifa. She is, without question, one of the most exceptional individuals that I have ever come into contact with. She is a tremendous scholar. She is a wonderful colleague. She's a fantastic friend. And I am so proud to introduce you to Dr. Tessa Shalouche. After such an introduction, um, bear with me, this is not an easy lecture, especially as I am a real doctor, not a play play one, a family physician. I treat patients every day. And I'm going to talk about another group of doctors tonight. I'm going to start with a book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, we hear the story of two midwives, Shifra and Pua. When Pharaoh fails to actually eliminate the Jews by hard labor, he decides on another method, basically genocide. And he calls the midwives, Shifra and Pua, and he tells them they have to kill all the male children, all the Jewish male children. At this point, they were faced with a choice. They could obey and say that they were only following orders, or these two midwives could refuse and, for, and face dire consequences. What did Shifra and Pua decide to do? But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them. They refused. And at this point, we would expect the story to continue that the king had these two midwives killed because of their disobedience. However, the, kill does not, the king does not kill them, but rather ga gathers them and asks them why they made their decisions as they did. 
Surprisingly, not only are they not punished, but we are told, and God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. If these two midwives, Shifra and Pua, had simply done their job, had simply followed orders, Moses would have been killed as soon as he was born. And where would we be today, the Jewish people? This story is pertinent to what I'm going to talk about tonight. We are here to talk about medicine during the Holocaust, medicine during the Nazi period. And some of you might be wondering what I'm going to say. Medicine under the Nazis made a signal contribution to the evolution of medical ethics. After the war, we had learned what the Nazi medical profession had done. The Hippocratic Oath, which was around for thousands and thousands of years, was changed for the first time. They had to add an extra clause into the Hippocratic Oath. It was called the Geneva Declaration. It was issued in 1948, and they added a special passage. I will not permit consideration of race, religion, nationality, party politics, or social standing to intervene between my duty and my patience. So why did this oath, which had been around, as I said, for thousands and thousands of years, have to be changed now for the first time? This is what we're going to talk about tonight. This is a film in German. It doesn't matter that the sound is not so good. The year is 1946, and we are in a courtroom in Nuremberg, Germany. Those are the judges at the trial. They are American. People sitting in the dock, there are 23 defendants sitting in the dock there. 20 men, 22 men, one woman, 20 doctors, three administrators in the medical uh, administration. That's the prosecutor, Telford Taylor. Those people sitting that are being filmed now that you can see in the frame are all physicians, like myself. At the end of the war, this trial, which took place almost a year from part 46 to 47, 23 physicians and three, as I said, 20 doctors and three medical uh, personnel were indicted at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity. This was the first time the doctors had ever been tried in history for crimes against humanity. These were not um, little people. They were tenured professors from other universities, the head of the army, clinical directors, Hitler's personal doctor, the head of the Air Force, and biomedical researchers who were employed by the pharmaceutical industry, by the military, and, by, and at universities. This was a murder trial, but not just a mere murder trial. The first time the doctors are tried with crimes against humanity, with murder. It is known as the doctor's trial or the medical trial, and it was one of the first post-war Nuremberg trials to be held. It was held by the Americans. The originally, they wanted to hold it, hold it as an international trial, but in the end, politics ruled, and the Americans took over, and they held the trial, and they indicted, found these uh, 20 people to, uh, uh, to try them, and the Americans ran the trial. At the trial, Andrew Ivey, who was one of the medical consultants, wrote a sentence that has profound importance. Had the profession taken a strong stand, our profession, my profession, against the mass killing of sick Germans before the war, it is conceivable that the entire idea and technique of death factories for genocide would not have materialized. It's a pretty powerful statement to make, and um, I hope that in a few minutes' time you will realize that it's very true. If the doctors had refused, who knows how things might have turned out. There are other questions. Why did they do what they did? What were the political, the professional, the personal contexts that allowed doctors to use their skills 
to torture and murder rather than to help and heal. You must know that German medicine at this time was the most advanced and sophisticated country in the world. If you wanted to learn anything in medicine, you went to Germany. Half of the, no world, of the world's Nobel Prizes for Science came out of Germany. Uh, the American school, the American medical school and our schools in Israel are based on the German system of learning. If you, it was the most sophisticated place in the world to learn medicine and to perform research, medical research. So these same doctors, what happened? How is it that they did what they did? They took an allegiance of, 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 uh, of uh, obedience to Hitler, but what of their Hippocratic oath? Of course, medicine was not alone in support of Nazi uh, policies, but the medical profession differs from other professionals in, this, in this, its explicit commitment to our Hippocratic oath. And it did not start in Germany. In the 1980s, we have Herbert Spencer defining what he called was survival of the fittest. Basically, that the evolution of mankind would depend on the fit surviving, and that it was only natural if the unfit should be left to die off. And then we have in 1859, Charles Darwin writing his Origin of Species, basically a very similar uh, theory, the, what, what he called natural selection. Talking about nature, of course, and then his cousin, this man in the picture, and Mendel with his gene theory, of course, at the same time. Did I go through? Yeah, Darwin, we have Mendel at the same time starting the beginning of what we know to gen genetics today with, with uh, different P studies. All this is happening in the world at the same time. And then we have a cousin of Charles Darwin in Britain who takes Darwin's theory and takes it a step further. In other words, uh, if we can do something, if, if people can do something to society to make society better, take the natural selection of Darwin and modify it so that humans can be better. The study of all agencies which can improve or impair the racial quality of future generations. He, terms, he coins this, this study of his or this belief of his eugenics, which in Greek actually means well-born, good genes. They want society to be composed of members who have good genes. And this was all in England, and it reached the States, it came here. Where here it actually prospered. This is what they believed in. This is an American family. This is what was considered good genes. White, healthy, multiple children, productive, working. The American who ran the show basically was Charles Davenport. They established laboratories on Long Island to develop this theory, to prove that certain elements of society were eugenically, were genetically better than others. They were supported by large foundations, Carnegie Institute, Rockefeller Institute. There was a huge amount of money behind the eugenic society in America. They wanted to make records of families. And the intent was actually to, um, they estimated that about 10% of the population at the time, which was about a million people, were considered genetically defective. And they wanted to make, register these people in offices with records to record these people. It hadn't been decided what to do with the records yet, but the, rec but the offices were, the people went around collecting the data. It wasn't enough. What, what was considered unfit? These were the categories of people who were considered unfit for society, eugenically unfit. Feeble-minded, which is a category on its own. It consists of, contains anything that doesn't fit basically into the other ones. And as you can see, all the other categories, alcoholics, deaf, blind, predisposed to certain diseases, all the people who were unproductive and ill, chronically ill. It wasn't enough just to register the people. They had to teach the society what they were talking about, and so they held eugenic exhibits, markets, fairs, to teach the citizens of the country what was considered to be eugenically fit and what was not. 
They had international conferences on eugenics. It wasn't the days like today where we have airplanes and email and uh, Wi-Fi. In those days, they had international conferences on eugenics, and they swapped ideas between the continents, between mainly between Europe in, and uh, the States. Two of the conferences were held in New York. The first one was held in London. The, the eugenics movement becomes a worldwide movement. As you can see, Sweden, Brazil, marriage counseling is begun. They began to counsel people about on who is deemed suitable for them to marry. This is in the United States of America. On the right is a poster from Germany, but this starts in the States. And then we have the classic case, which many of you must be aware of, of Carrie Buck, who is a 17-year-old young girl and has the misfortune to be 17 years old, unwed, pregnant, probably after having been raped by a member of her family, and with a mother who is considered at that time, who was considered at that time feeble-minded and who was actually institutionalized, as was very accepted at the time. So we have this unwed young girl who is pregnant out of, uh, and, and her mother is feeble-minded. And basically, the, her doctor is the one who, who, who makes a decision that Carrie should be sterilized. And the court go, her case goes to the Supreme Court of the States, where Justice Olive, Oliver Wendell Holmes makes the infamous decision that three generations of imbeciles are enough. And Carrie is forced to have, a st to her, she has her baby, and then she is forced against her will, or not even against her will, without ever telling her what was being done to her, to be sterilized. In 1907, Indiana was the first state to enact sterilization laws. So now they've registered all these people who are eugenically defective. Now they are going into action and, and having active programs what to do with them. So 1907, Indiana makes, passes the first law, and by 1935, all the states that are colored in there with lines basically have laws to sterilize people. No, there's no such thing as informed consent. They're never having to ask them. Their pa the parents of the children who were sterilized were never asked. Uh, the, main the main state to sterilize people was California, and you will be surprised to learn that in Virginia, the sterilization law was only repealed in 1974. The immigration laws were based on eugenic principles. The eugenicists were uh, involved in forming the immigration laws. It was considered uh, better to have people from Central and um, from uh, Nordic and Anglo-Saxon European countries than from Central and Southern Europe. Let's go back to Germany. In Germany, the same eugenics movement grows, and here they start calling it another term called racial hygiene, giving it a sort of a medically or scientific uh, uh, terminology. As I said, there was enormous uh, uh, cooperation between the two sides. This is a German eugenicist, one of the leading professors at the leading institutes in Germany, reading the Journal of Hereditary, which is an American hereditary uh, medical genetics, basically, uh, magazine, um, very early at the beginning of the 20th century. There was enormous cooperation between the two sides. That's the same professor on the right, of course. This is all comes at the time in Germany where we are post-World War I, where there is terrible unemployment, inflation, depression, uh, uh, people have no jobs. They want to make the country he healthy again. They want to build their country into what they remembered as it was before World War I. And then Hitler arrives on the scene. And in 1923, he, he tries to take the government and he is uh, put in jail. And while in jail, he writes Mein, K mein Kampf, his, his uh, Bible, basically. And while he is there, it has been proved that he, is, he has rec he received um, papers and journals and books from publishers who were um, in agreement with his policies. And he actually puts the, uh, and some of them were uh, uh, medical publications, and he actually um, 
encompasses or, or, or uh, includes medical biology uh, and biologic imagery in Mein Kampf. And um, so that basically we have, he look at, you, we actually have a lot of medicine in Mein Kampf that is actually used as a, re a rationalization, as a scientific legitimization for the national social policies. Eventually, n racial hygiene, basically, and Nazi poli and policy could not be differentiated. They were one and the same. This was what medicine was believing, and this was what the politics were believing. Nazism had become what they called applied biology. Hitler was called the doctor of the German nation. He was going to make the nation healthy. And it was a symbiotic relationship. He looked to the doctors to support him. And he called to them and he said, I cannot do without you. If you fail me, all is lost. He needed the doctors. He wanted the scientists. He knew that he needed them to carry out the policies that he was going to go forward with. They had negative eugenics and positive eugenics, exactly what I was talking about before in the States. Negative eugenics was getting, rid, was getting rid of society of the bad elements, and positive eugenics was encouraging the better elements of society to reproduce. The doctors were going to fix this problem. The state was ill, and the doctors were the ones who were going to fix this problem. This is a medical journal on the left. It's not a... It's not, the, it's not a, a tabloid. It's a medical journal where they tell the doctors of the Nazi state, this is your job now. You have to take command. And on the right is not a Nazi party, he's not a, a politician. He's the head of the German Medical Association, dressed up in his Nazi uniform, firmly believing in this policy that we are going to take power, that the, the doctors are going to become now um, state uh, leaders of the state, they are going to follow the politicians blindly into correcting what was wrong with German society. Dual loyalty, which is one of our firm um, ethical dilemmas that we have today. In Nazi Germany, there was no such thing as dual loyalty. The doctors were, de were demanded of them and they agreed that their only loyalty was to the state. They were not there was no such thing as dual loyalty. The individual patient did not matter anymore. The only important thing was the state. One of the first laws that the Nazis pass, laws, in 1933, as they come into power, is the sterilization law, based on the American sterilization law. And in the poster, you can see flags of other countries where it was too legal to have sterilization. And once again, the categories of who was deemed f worthy of sterilization were pretty similar to the American eugenics categories. <coughs> Doctor-patient confidentiality was of absolutely no importance. Nobody was asked, nobody was asked for consent, no parents were asked for consent. There were hereditary courts to rule over these case cases. Midwives and doctors had to report these cases to certain officers where they were then sent to the courts. And on the courts, the doctors sat as judges. Three out of the four judges on these hereditary courts decided who could be sterilized. We're talking about German citizens, not Jews. German citizens who were ill physically and mentally and unproductive. 400,000 of them were sterilized against their will. This is one of the most, this is like the uh, NIH, this is the one of the most pro uh, sophisticated institutes in the world for human subjects research and anthropology research. They had, uh, they had special um, newspapers, the genetic doctors, to teach the doctors so that they could learn all about what was expected of them. And of course, the Jewish question came, the anti-Semitism that was part of the policy uh, party policy entered the medical world as well. The man in the picture is doing twin studies. This is in 1923. This is long before the war. At one of the most sophisticated institutes in Germany is performing twin studies. His name is Professor von Fischer. 
The man on the right is Joseph Mengele. That was, for sh that was Mengele's boss. This started in 23. They were doing genetic studies on twins already in 1923. What was amazing is that not only did they believe this, but they taught this at medical schools. So when we think about the Nazi doctors, we think about them throwing their ethics out, out of the window and just behaving appallingly and atrociously and doing what they did without, without ethics. We know today that they had ethics, and not only did they have ethics, they taught ethics. They were the only country in the world that had a compulsory course for medical ethics at medical schools. Every single medical school in Nazi Germany had to teach medical ethics. What they were being taught, that's what they were being taught, that the physician has a loyalty to the state, that they were meant to be biological soldiers. This is what the students are being taught. The Jewish doctors, it was okay for to, to uh, take the place of Jewish doctors, that they should not treat Aryan patients and vice versa. S in su full support of the sterilization law and in full support of what I'm going to talk about now, which is even worse, which is what they call the, the euthanasia program. This is what the students were being taught at medical school. It was a compulsory subject. And then we have World War I break out. World War II breaks out in 1939. And together with the war, together with the onset of war, Hitler sets another program in place. And this is what I was gonna, what I told you, this was called what they called the euthanasia program. This never became law. It started with these two people in the picture. One was Hitler's personal physician who was held afterwards, was tried at Nuremberg. And the other one was his secretary, where he actually wrote a directive and gave it to these two people who forwarded to medical directors at institutions, allowing doctors to decide who, which of their patients they could kill. They called it euthanasia. It was, of course, in no, in no connection to what we know as euthanasia today. Some of them were certainly not suffering. They were just mentally retarded or physically um, maimed or psychiatrically ill. It never became law, as I said, and the doctors were empowered to murder their patients together with their nursing staff, of course. The offices where they had this whole, um, where this establishment was uh, formed and where they sat and decided on the basis of forms only. They never examined the patients. Yes, well, they, they used to sign the forms. I think I have a... That's how big it was. That's how vast this organization was. It was meant to be secret at the beginning. Of course, it couldn't have been kept secret. It was such a vast organization. Most of those people and functionaries in this organization were medical professionals, nurses, and doctors, and hospital administrators. On the basis of forms alone, it started with children. 5,000 children were um, uh, deemed eligible to be murdered by the medical staff that was meant to care for these sick people. Doctors supervised the, the it was a very complicated system where they were transported to certain um, hospitals to be murdered. Special wards were formed for this operation to be carried out. Doctors supervised the transportation of these patients. As you can see, the buses were painted over so that the people living in the area would not know what was going on. Six centers were formed, special hospitals in, uh, uh, with special departments for the murder of these patients. It was, as I said, complicated. They transported them across the whole of Germany. That's one of them. Another one, a castle that was, conf uh, that was, trans uh, it was transformed into a euthanasia center with a, in the basement they used to kill the patients. 200,000 German citizens are murdered. Patients are murdered by the medical staff, what they called euthanasia, which was actually medical murder, by the staff that was supposed to take care of them because they were physically and mentally and otherwise considered as having lives as not worthy of living, and 5,000 children. We cannot 
Uh, there were a few. There were some that refused. Probably on one hand we can count the number of people that refused, medical directors or um, pers uh, uh, personal physicians. On one hand, I think I can recount the, uh, the names of people that we know refused to send their patients to their deaths. And then, of course, we have the final solution where they build the concentration camps. We haven't got there yet. Now we get there to where we have the final solution. They decide what to do with the Jews, and they build the concentration camps. And they take this knowledge, this medical, the scientific knowledge and technology, and copy-paste it to the gas chambers and the crematoria in the concentration camps. On the right, on your left, sorry, is a gas chamber in one of those hospitals that was used to euthanize the German citizens. And on the right is the gas chamber at Auschwitz. The same technology, the same personnel were used to advise the concentration camp personnel how to use a gas chamber. They had experience from the T4, what they called the T4 euthanasia program, and the same personnel medical personnel were used in transferring them to the concentration camps. Doctors had other important jobs in the concentration camps. They were the ones, certainly at the beginning and in many other cases, to select people when they arrived on the ramp. Many cases were of doctors selecting people who could live and who, could, who were meant to be sent to the other side to die. Doctors made selections in what they called the hospital barracks. And of course, doctors performed the horrendous experimentation that we know about. Because of the experiments, we, they tried the doctors after the war, as I, as I began, and um, the, the people that they could find, the people that they could prove, it wasn't easy. A lot of the records were destroyed, and it was incredibly difficult to find the people who had, were scattered all over Europe, and they had to prove that they had done what they had done. Part of the judgment of this special trial was what we have, what we know today as the Nuremberg Code. Ten points which define what is, what is permissible in human subjects research. I think that it's fair to say that this is the strictest code that medicine has ever received. All subsequent codes which we know today as Hill Helsinki, that's what we use today, <coughs> excuse me, all subsequent codes, all the Helsinki uh, revisions of this code are all less stringent than Nuremberg as far as patient rights and patient protection are concerned. It's all been washed down a little bit. Nuremberg, its first and major concern was for patient rights, which is basically um, what Nuremberg did was it combined Hippocratic Oath, Hippocratic rights with human rights. Since then, uh, all, the, all the declarations have been less stringent than Nuremberg. I went to medical school a long time ago. Nobody told us about Nuremberg. Nobody learned about Nuremberg at medical school. It has been argued that all our bioethics actually has its roots in post-war Nuremberg. I think I would pr probably agree with that. But after Nuremberg, after 1947, the world was completely silent. As the whole world was silent about the Holocaust, people didn't want to listen, people didn't want to know, and of course it was really difficult to talk. The medical world was silent too. It was really uncomfortable to even think of doctors being like us. It was the Nazi doctors, as Stacy said, it was considered a code for barbarians. It was not a code for, for human beings. Those were the Nazi doctors. It was only a few of them, and they were crazy in any case. And we, in the West, could never, ever do what the Nazis did. So that uh, basically it was ignored, and it wasn't talked about. It was very uncomfortable to talk about doctors being the same, being made up of the same DNA as, as, as other doctors. But we know that 50% of the German doctors belong to the Nazi party. Look at the other professions. 22% of the teachers, 24 of the musicians, 24 of the lawyers, 25 of the lawyers. Something attracted the doctors to the Nazi party. Unlike other professions, there was something there that spoke the same language, that held the same power. 
in 2012, very late, but ne better late than never, the German Medical Association offered an apology. The crimes were not simply the acts of individual doctors, but rather took place with a substantial involvement of leading representatives of the medical association and medical specialist bodies, as well as with a considerable participation of eminent representatives of university medicine and renowned biomedical research faculties. This came out of Nuremberg. At one of their meetings, the German Medical Association issued this apology. The same Nuremberg where the rallies were held, the same Nuremberg where they passed the anti-Semitic laws in 1935 where they defined who was one quarter Jewish, who was one half Jewish, who was three quarters Jewish, and who was not Jewish at all. The same Nuremberg, at, in, at the same Nuremberg, they issued this apology. And they continued. In contrast to still widely accepted views, the initiative for the most serious human rights violations did not originate from the political authorities at the time, but from the physicians themselves. These doctors were not mad, and they were not coerced. They did this in full, and were fully aware of what they were doing. And what is so frightening is that they were convinced that they were doing what was right. So it is safe to say that the Holocaust differs from other forms of genocide in that it was genocide that involved the active participation of science and medicine. After the war, many of the leading positions in German and other medical professional organizations were held by physicians who had been active members of the Nazi party or its affiliated organizations. Almost every aspect of contemporary ethics is influenced by what transpired or by the history of physician involvement in the Holocaust. Every aspect, not only the research to human subjects research aspect which was addressed at Nuremberg, but every aspect of eth contemporary ethics was abused by the Nazi German <coughs> um, medical profession. Abortion, unethical research, dual loyalty, pharmaceutical ethics, whistleblowing, there are, ha there are tens of, of ethical uh, um, topics that we can talk about that were abused by the German medical, uh, uh, or by the German physicians. In 2015, the German, the Israeli Medical Association, together with the German Medical Association, at a, uh, issued this statement, whereby they said, these human rights violations perpetrated in the name of medicine under the Nazi regime continue to have repercussions to this day and raise questions concerning the way in which physicians perceive themselves, their professional behavior, and their medical ethics why they did what they did, and how important it is to teach about it. The Holocaust began in depersonalizing the victims and ended in depersonalizing the, perp the perpetrators. The Nazi medical establishment began by depersonalizing their patients and ended in the perpetration of genocide. It's not easy to say that as a family physician. Stacey mentioned the case book, we firmly believe in personalizing the uh, issues so that people ca so that students can learn from these issues and we were given the permission or the backing of UNESCO to to publish the book where we actually pre present personal cases of perpetrators of victims and we were I'm very grateful that we were actually given permission for half the book is uh, about the Jewish doctors who worked in their professions in the various camps and ghettos and who were confronted with ethical dilemmas. And so we give a face and a name to these people which makes it more personal and people, uh, so that the students can actually remember that we're basically made of the same DNA, all of us. By discussing personal cases, we believe that we can conduct, combat ignorance and prejudice. However monstrous the deeds were, it's important to remember that they were not monsters. They were human beings. They did monstrous things, but they were not monsters. And I want to end my talk by going back to Francis Galton, who was the man who coined the term eugenics. Francis Galton was a genius, and he also, 
probably well, gave us the basis for statistics and he also gave us the basis for fingerprinting, which today, of course, is used worldwide for everything. Yad Vashem, which is our Holocaust Memorial Museum in Jerusalem, in 2016 had a competition. They have a yearly competition for artists to draw drawings so that they can use as um, an annual drawing. And this won the, draw the competition in 2016, and I found it appropriate to bring. It's a drawing of a fingerprint, but in the drawing of the fingerprint is barbed wire. Every single, f every single line there is not a fingerprint as we know, but is barbed wire. And I think that that is a very good summation to a talk where doctors should remember that we are first and foremost human beings. take about a minute or two to stretch um, and I'm going to invite the panelists to uh, come on stage so we can begin the next portion of our presentation. Again, after the panel presentation has concluded, I certainly invite everybody to approach the presenters from this evening um, and ask questions and engage in conversation, what have you. So um, I already introduced myself, but for those of you who may have come in a little bit later, my name is Dr. Stacy Gallen, and I am the founding director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. I'm going to begin by just giving you a little introduction to MIME, what it is that we do, um, and how potentially we can help any of you who are sitting here today who are interested in this field. So um, the Maimonides Institute is a nonprofit organization. Uh, and we provide programs, educational programs for healthcare professionals mainly, that describe the ways in which the power of medicine, the promise of scientific progress, were abused in Nazi Germany. So that's how we, again, reflect upon the past. But I would argue, as I stated earlier, more importantly, we try to take those lessons and use them as a guide for people in healthcare professions now. So that includes nurses, PAs, physicians, pharmacists, people that are uh, creating healthcare policy, you name it, and I think that there are lessons to be learned there. We are very fortunate to be able to do what we do because we have the support of some wonderful, wonderful people, um, scholars and lay people. We have actually uh, two of our board members here tonight. Dr. Uh, we have Dr. Martin Katzenstein. Um, he is a neonatologist from the uh, Boston Children's Health Physicians. And uh, John Zytel, who I don't think is in this room right now because he is diligently working on um, our online presence. Here you can see a little bit about our mission. We use lessons from the Holocaust as guides for current medical practice, healthcare policy, and human rights efforts. Um, so again, what we try to do is reflect upon the past in order to protect the future. Um, that's our goal that, uh, again, permeates everything that we do. And again, we're trying to inspire ethical and humane practices in every phase of medical care and healthcare policy by informing the integration of science and technology guided by respect for human rights, life, and dignity. So that sounds wonderful, uh, but practically speaking, what do we do? Uh, and so the answer to that is, is very varied. We mostly try to, to take everything that we do and put it online. And the reason for that is because, again, we're trying to transcend the traditional boundaries in Holocaust education. If you noticed before when I was sitting in the second row, I was videotaping Tessa's lecture. Um, what I was actually doing was streaming it live to Facebook. Uh, there's an entirely new generation of people coming up now that don't necessarily have a personal connection to the Holocaust. So how do we remedy that? 
how do we make sure that this, these lessons continue to be passed down? We take our programs, like this program today, and we put them online. We make them available for anyone to view free of charge. Physicians, PAs, nurses, and pharmacists can earn free continuing medical education credits. Uh, those of you who are sitting here right now, if you happen to find yourself in one of those groups, you will be able to earn uh, CME credits. However, it takes us a little while. Whenever we do a live program, we don't know what these panelists up here are going to say. One of them might go rogue. You never know. Um, and we don't know how long the conversation is uh, going to go. So uh, again, in order to follow the proper accrediting guidelines, it takes us a little while. However, if you would like to uh, see some of our past programs, and again, they're on demand and you can earn free CME credits for them, you can go to our website, uh, which you're going to see in a minute, and there's about four or five different programs on there already. Um, and again, we put them up there. We've, we have been able to reach people in 23 different countries. Um, and p countries that you wouldn't necessarily associate with Holocaust education. Again, this is all about transcending boundaries here. So um, we also obviously offer physically based programs like the one we're doing tonight in partnership with uh, various different universities um, and organizations, museums. Basically, if there are people out there who are interested in this topic, we are going to do our very, very best to be able to offer some type of program that will meet your needs. As Tessa mentioned earlier, uh, we founded the Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust through the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics, which is located in Haifa. And through our work with uh, the UNESCO Chair of Bioethics, we've been able to reach people, again, in multiple countries. We've already been contacted by people in Greece and Argentina who are interested in creating subunits on bioethics and the Holocaust. It's wonderful that we're all here today paying attention to this very important topic. But what happens when you leave? We are only, so there's only so many of us. So we have to make sure that these become enduring lessons that don't get forgotten. And how do we do that? We create multipliers. So again, by putting these programs online, we can make sure that they're out there. We're creating resources. So if there are people that are interested in teaching about this, uh, if there are people that are interested in running a program, whatever it is, we want to make sure that you have the resources and the support to do this. Uh, so one of those multipliers, uh, recently I founded the Center for Human Dignity and Bioethics, Medicine, and Health at Misericordia University. Misericordia is a Catholic university in Dallas, Pennsylvania. Um, and again, in the, in the interest of transcending traditional boundaries, I think it's incredibly important that we're, we go past religion. Um, this is not solely a Jewish issue. This is a human rights issue that affects everybody. When we talk about, you know, Tessa was talking about the history uh, within medicine, this is something that everyone needs to learn about because the implications are there for everyone. So you can't really see it there, but our website is www.mimeh.org. When you came in, there was a table. The table had a brochure. If you didn't take it when you came in, please take it on the way out. There's also a card. You can feel free to contact me anytime. If you go to our website, you will see uh, the lovely little homepage there. We're in the midst of redoing it, uh, hopefully effective January 1st, so that we can continue to add more content. On the bottom over there, you will see that's one of the programs that we did. We partnered with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and their Deadly Medicine exhibit. Uh, it's a traveling exhibit. We videotaped it. We videotaped uh, a guided tour of that, and then it was accredited for CME. So um, you can see that on our website. And here you can see an International Holocaust Remembrance Day interfaith ceremony that we ran at Misericordia last year. Also on our website, Tessa mentioned the casebook for bioethics and the Holocaust. If you look on our website, there's a section that says UNESCO. If you click on that section, you will see a link for the PDF file and again, you can get the entire casebook there. So there's a lot of great resources. Um, and I encourage you to check it out. Uh, and I encourage you, if this is something that you're interested in, uh, please join us uh, in whatever way you can. This is something that is only possible because of the passion and dedication and commitment of people like you. So without, again, further ado, here's what we're here for today. 70 years after the Nuremberg Code, what have we learned? I think we've already talked about the co-sponsors of this program. This slide's going to stay up here during the panel so that you know who everybody is. I had them sit in alphabetical order so that you can see. It goes Ira, Tessa, Nancy, Arid, and Omar, just to make it easy for everybody to understand. 
Um, and so again, what we're going to do, I'm going to ask each of our panelists a question based on their specific area of expertise. They will have, let's say, between three and five minutes to answer that question, and then the other panelists can feel free to chime in uh, if they'd like to. The final two questions will be open to all of the panelists, as they are definitely questions um, that everybody should um, probably have an opinion on. I'm going to try and introduce our panelists, but I'm going to warn you that the people that we have on the stage are some of the most exceptional scholars in the field. Uh, we would be here for the next three days if I gave you a comprehensive introduction of each of them. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. But again, pay attention. If you're interested, go speak with them afterwards. So first, Ira, we have Ira Bedzo over here. Yeah, that's right. You'll have to wave. <laughs> Ira is a, a PhD, he's an assistant professor of medicine and the director of the Biomedical Ethics and Humanities program at New York Medical College. He is also a senior scholar at the Aspen Center for Social Values. Dr. Bedzo received his PhD from Emory University, an MA from Toro College, an MA from the University of Chicago, and a BA from Princeton University, as well as rabbinic ordination. He is the author of six books and numerous articles and chapters on law, medical ethics, and philosophy. Sitting next to him is Tessa Shalouche. I apologize, but you already heard her introduction, and again, in the interest of time, she's fantastic, so I'm just going to use those words and moving on. Okay. Next to Tessa, you'll see Nancy Dubler. Nancy is a professor of bioethics emerita at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the founder and former director of the Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine Division of Bioethics. She serves as a consultant for ethics at New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation and an adjunct professor at NYU Langone Medical Center in their division of bioethics and Department of Public Health. Nancy received her AB from Barnard College and her LLB from Harvard Law School. She has held countless academic appointments and published literally more books and articles than I can count. She was also the founding editor of the Journal of Prison and Jail Health, Medicine, Law, Corrections, and Ethics, and she has served on several institutional review boards and ethics committees in the New York area. Next to Nancy, you'll see Irit Felsen. Irit is a PhD clinical psychologist licensed to practice in New Jersey, where she works with individual, individuals, couples, and families. She received her undergraduate degree from Haifa University and her MA in clinical psychology from Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Dr. Felton earned her PhD in psychology from Hamburg University in Germany and continued her pre- and postdoctoral training at the Yale Psychiatric Institute at Yale University, where she is currently a member of the Yale Trauma Studies Group in the Genocide Studies Program. She's a clinical specialist and coordinator of Holocaust services at Jewish Family Services of Metro West New Jersey and is on faculty at the Ohel Uni Institute for Professional Training in Brooklyn. She is also a clinical specialist providing trauma intervention for a national network of crisis care and has a research affiliation at the Center for Neuroaffective Sciences at the University of Geneva. <sighs> okay. And last but not least, we have Omar Haik. Omar is a psychiatrist and social scientist who studies questions at the intersection of global health anthropology, social psychology, bioethics, and religion. At Harvard Medical School, he is a faculty member in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, the program in psychiatry and law, and is co-director of the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics American Unit. He received his MD from Harvard Medical School and his MTS from Harvard Divinity School. He has also earned degrees, including a PhD from Brown University. He has published research on a number of different topics, including mental disabilities and human rights, physician participation in the Nazi party, financial conflicts of interest between the pharmaceutical industry and clinical medicine, conceptions of personhood and death in Islam, informed consent amidst disorders of the self, and vulnerabilities among young Westerners joining terrorist organizations. And again, I really had to whittle this list down. They're, I mean, really very comprehensive. Uh, his work has been published and presented all over the world, and his ideas have been covered in a number of international media venues. Uh, so again, we have a bunch of slackers up on stage here, so you know, just humor them and listen to uh, what they have to say. And so, we will begin with some questions. So the first question is for Nancy. 
As we heard in our introductory lecture, the doctor's trial at Nuremberg was unique in exposing and detailing the ethical violations perpetrated by those in the medical community and by holding medical professionals accountable for these violations. The Nuremberg Code was created as a direct response to these heinous, never before seen ethical violations and the lack of accountability and responsibility on the part of the medical community. The Nuremberg Code represented a paradigm shift from the more traditional paternalistic view of healthcare as being physician driven to a more patient centered system that emphasizes autonomy and informed consent. So as Dr. Shalush said earlier, it's often said that the Nuremberg Code is the foundation on which modern bioethics rests. My question to you is do you agree with this statement? Can you speak about the importance of the doctor's trial at Nuremberg for the history of bioethics and research regulations? Thank you very much and thank you <clears throat> for having me. Having grandchildren means I generally have a cold, so <laughs> I apologize. Um, no, I don't think the Nuremberg Code was central to the development of bioethics. It was crucial for the development of bioethics, and let me explain why I take that position. First of all, remember what medicine was in the 1920s and 30s. Forget about high-tech academic medical centers and liver transplants and intensive care units. Medicine was people who called themselves doctors, who didn't really know very much, didn't have a great deal to offer, and taught the way they'd been taught. There was no evidence-based medicine. There were no particular theories of medicine. I'm not even sure we have them today. It was very different. Medicine was primitive. The doctor-patient relationship was primitive, treatments were primitive, and medical ethics was primitive. And in that very primitive state, the takeover of medicine by euthanasia attacked the very basis of healing. There's a wonderful documentary called Healing by Killing, which documents what happened in euthanasia. Now, what went on in Nazi medicine was horrible. It was systematic killing based upon the techniques developed in euthanasia. It was torture. It was putting people in vats of ice cubes to see how long it would take them to die. It was a total deformation of humanity, not just medicine. But in 1947, when the Nuremberg Code came out, and remember that the code was actually the decision of the judges. It's an opinion from which the code is derived. And in America, we said, oh, aren't those Germans terrible people? And look what they did. But that doesn't have anything to do with us. We don't do anything like this. So that's them, and then there's us. And largely, as the silence surrounded the Holocaust, so I was in Israel when the radio came on and said, Matsanu et Eichmann be Israel we found Eichmann in Israel. And I thought, no, that doesn't really sound right. But it's not till the Eichmann trial that the real discussion of the Holocaust takes place. But back in America, in 1972, the Detroit Free Press published what had been well known in medical journals, the Tuskegee experiments. These were experiments by the US Public Health Service based on racist assumptions that black men had greater sexual appetites and would therefore get syphilis. And when new treatments for syphilis were discovered, 
they were denied to these men, where a nurse went and followed them around the country to make sure they didn't get treated. Well, Americans picked up and said, oh my heavens, did that happen here? Well, all the medical journals knew it had happened here. And then we learned about the experiments for hepatitis C that were performed on mentally ill, defective children without parental consent to see because they were there. They were going to get hepatitis in institutions because all children did, so let's learn from it. Well, from 1972, you have the development of American awareness of what's happening, and that in fact, research is infused by power, by the use of people without their consent, especially children, prisoners, and the poor, and that we need to address this. And so in 1981, you get the first federal regulations governing research with human subjects. So, Nuremberg needed to be referenced to the American reality for it to become relevant to our discussions. And in a sense, it needed us to look at our own reality and accept our own complicity in the use of others before we were able to develop effective regulations that could protect human subjects. Anyone else on the panel like to chime in? Go ahead. I could, I could, uh, I could, actually, I thought, that was, I thought that was really well put, and I, I, I thank you for your uh, introduction to the medical ethics and how the Nuremberg Code was, and I agree, how the Nuremberg Code was maybe not central but crucial. The one thing I, I would add um, is that if we're going to take the Nuremberg Code as the crucial aspect of medical ethics or bioethics seriously, then there's uh, a really a, a certain context and frame that we have to consider. Uh, first is that it's not the beginning of medical ethics. We know Germany had a medical ethics code. The AMA had a, uh, the American Medical As Association had a medical ethics code. And that medical ethics code was used as a way to professionalize uh, the, the, the medical profession to become a, let's say, uh, almost a semi-autonomous group that had their internal morality or their internal virtues. Um, before the codes, there was not necessarily a um, rule-based type of ethics, but you see even Benjamin Rush, who was you know, in the Continental Congress, wrote an essay on the virtues and vices of the physician. So there, there was this type of, of, of moral uh, aptitude in physician practice. But what's interesting about the Nuremberg Code is that the Nuremberg Code, if it is the foundation for modern bioethics, it was created by people who are specifically not doctors. It is created by judges, which means that bioethics, to be taken seriously, was no longer about the internal morality of medicine. It's not an internal affair, um, but it becomes a, a, a societal issue where the people who are participating are not simply the doctors who have the authority to treat, but society as a whole who has the responsibility for the community that, that it oversees. So I think that's a wonderful point, and I would respond in the following way. There was always a primitive medical ethic, do no harm. Um, that was hard to do in medicine, because mainly what medicine did for two millennia was do harm. So do no harm was a big, a big reach. Then I would say the, the codes that existed were not professional codes. They were guild codes. They were protective codes. Here we are, we are now special, so we're gonna protect ourselves. They weren't about ethics, they were somehow, I, I would argue, about work uh, structuring and protecting a work product. And finally, I, I think where Nuremberg, so the very, the informed consent of the individual is the first statement of the Nuremberg Code. And that sounds great, guys. But you know what? It isn't adequate. 
because what we found is that epidemiological research and research on safety and efficacy, and there are many kinds of research with minimal harm, which the federal regulations explored, number one, and have come back to look at in the new iteration, number two, where if you use informed consent as your only doorway, you can't do the research and you can't get improvements in medicine. So I'm reluctant to sign on to broad statements. I like the little interstices that define the problems. And I think the Nuremberg Code was done by judges, but because these were crimes. These were not doctors who were practicing medicine. These were doctors who were torturing and murdering and stepped outside of the human condition to end lives. Go right ahead. Just as an anecdote, you said the Americans had codes. Well, I'll just tell you how it began. Uh, at Nuremberg, the defense uh, lawyers were very aware of the American experiments that had been <laughs> performed in the States, and they approached the prosecution with, and they made them face these uh, experiments, which were mainly uh, experiments that had been done on malaria on prisoners in Illinois. Correct. And the uh, American who I mentioned, Andrew Ivey, he was the medical consultant at Nuremberg, felt very uneasy because he had himself participated in these experiments with the prisoners in, uh, in Chicago. And they said to the, the, the defense lawyers, said to the prosecution, okay, look, <laughs> you've been doing the same things. You've been experimenting, so what is the difference in what you have been doing and what, we, and what the Germans had, and the Nazis had done? And he felt very, um, to put it mildly, uncomfortable. So he came home to Chicago and he approached the American Medical Association in 1946 or 47, and he had points, Andrew Ivey. He wrote actually only three points. One of them, I think, was informed consent and do no harm and whatever. And he approached the American Medical Association, who did not have strict formal guidelines for research, human subject research. And they said, OK, we'll appoint a committee. And they called the committee a green committee. And this committee was going to meet. It never met. But the... Andrew's point, uh, Andrew Ivey's points were published in the JAMA, in the Journal uh, in the American of the American Medical Association, and he went back to Nuremberg and he said to the court, okay, you see, we have guidelines. And they said to him, yeah, but, what but when were these guidelines written? And he admitted during the court that they were written in response to what he was expecting to be asked and what he was asked of by the, by the defense at, uh, during the court. And he said, this is what the Green Committee has decided, but the Green Committee, and he was actually on the verge of committing perjury, the Green Committee never met. So, in fact, the Americans did not have guidelines. They went, they, during the trial, the first American Medical Association's research, human subject research guidelines were formulated and um, in response to what the, uh, the Nazi Germans had asked, the prosecution had asked, the defense had asked, sorry. I'm in no way saying, of course, that the Americans, you know, the malaria experiments were unethical in that the, probably the prisoners didn't uh, receive any form of, co didn't, were never asked for consent, but they certainly weren't the brutal, cruel uh, experiments with the well, aim of, of maiming or killing the patients <laughs> that the Nazis were. But they certainly were unethical and there are parallels, there are similarities. I mean, they weren't torture. Yeah, of course. Um, but remember that the hepatitis experiments go on in the 60s with children whose parents are told, gee, we don't really have places for your child in this mental institution. However, if they come into the medical ward, then they'll have better food and better care 
And by the way, they'll participate in experiments. So doesn't that sound better? Tessa, we were speaking earlier about um, the German medical schools and their teaching. And this kind of uh, goes off of the question that we, we have just discussed. Many people think that there was no code of ethics, that, that German physicians during the Holocaust uh, were completely unethical um, and that everything they were doing was nothing short of torture. You recently published a paper that describes the ethical and moral education in German medical schools in the early 1900s. So um, my question for you is, first of all, can you, uh, I mean, I know you, you did talk a little bit about this in your lecture, but could you again go over some of the highlights of what German medical ethics, what their code of ethics was like at that time? Um, why it's so important for us to understand that there was, in fact, a code of ethics, even if it's not one that we today uh, would, would subscribe to. And, and also, how much you feel that kind of the indoctrination of that code was responsible. Everyone is always looking to try and figure out how could the doctors have done this? How could people do such a thing? Um, how, what role do you think that the German code of medical ethics played uh, in all of this? Yeah, I, I'm not going to give a, a, a very broad answer. I think I've talked enough about it. I, but what, what is important is that they were taught. Uh, they thought that this was right. They thought that this was the, the proper m way to, con to, to perform medicine. Um, there are doctorate theme uh, theses done by medical students that were found in, um, in an American, I forget which, which university, uh, where d a, a German students did theses on sterilization. They six, six papers have been published where they did theses on sterilization. What is ironic is that they dedicated them all to their mothers. <laughs> the students dedicated to their mothers. Yes. <laughs> um, and they detail in great, they, they give great, great details how these people were sterilized and why and what the family background was and what the reasoning was. And there's absolutely no um, discussion at all about the ethics, whether it was correct, whether it was not. These people came from a certain family where they were uh, uh, mentally retarded children and so that they, uh, the, the, the others had to be sterilized. It was considered that was what was right. And that was what, that's what's so scary. Um, they were taught that it was right, they thought that it was right, and they um, behaved as if it was right. Tessa, I, I've always been fascinated by whether <clears throat> what permitted that distortion was the concept, the central place of the concept of the Volk. Could you talk a little bit about the Volk, the state, the nation, the making kind of the, the duty, as I said, do, dual loyalty was non-existent. <laughs> They had to be loyal to their yeah. nation, to their country, to their state. I think it's, um, I don't know, something very, there's something very attractive to this holding of power that attracts positions. I think that Omar, r I read an article that you published about from a, psych from a psychological point of view. Maybe you can answer why you think there was something so attractive. Yes, sure. Well, the um, <laughs> on the question of what it was about the Volk, um, it's not specific to Germany either. If you think even in, even in any nation where you have uh, the, the social organism becomes sacralized or becomes uh, you know moralized as an entity with its own rights and interests above the individual. Uh, and I think the great contribution of the uh, the Western tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition, is the the dignity of the individual, which does get undermined uh, in various ways, both in in the Weimar Republic, but also in, in our own age, for example, with uh, utilitarian ethics, where uh, you know you're obligated to kill one to save five, and so on. Um, in, in in that context, it was more about um, you know uh, the, st the community is always prior to the individual, um, coming out of various philosophical theories. So I think that might go to your question. Mm -hmm. Very much, Omar. While 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 you're speaking, while you have the mic, um, again. I think most people are under the assumption that uh, these these physicians, uh, you know, were they just 
they were crazy. They, you know, um, how could they do something like this? How could anybody who's dedicated to healing um, do the things that these people did? Uh, and I think that, you know, it's, it, again, yes, obviously some of it has to do with kind of the uh, paradigm of the time where, you know, the Volk was the patient as opposed to the individual, so the idea of the greater good. Um, but, you know, also I think there are specific characteristics or vulnerabilities in the culture of medicine and the psychology of doctoring that makes physicians vulnerable to these kinds of ethical violations. And I, I know that you've done a lot of work in this area, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit um, to the question of what specifically it is within kind of this culture of medicine that could possibly allow something like this to happen. Yeah, it's, um, well, I, I would ask the audience to imagine what's the difference between a uh, literature professor and a doctor in, in terms of personality and psychology or, or a philosopher versus a doctor, right? So um, every profession has its own personality profile and some distribution. Obviously, everyone's unique. But um, if you can imagine in, in Germany, um, there are vulnerabilities. Why did the doctors join, right? You could think there's vulnerabilities specific to the profession, um, and there's vulnerabilities specific to the from the historical context, economic context. So in terms of the profession, um, doctors tend to have a profile of being a little very conscientious, as do uh, professionals and managers in organizations. So conscientiousness is good, but it also um, means you, if there's a protocol, you're going to follow it. Even if you don't really, uh, you know, think it's the right thing to do, you might just follow it anyway. So, uh, whereas if you're a kind of uh, introverted philosopher, English professor, you might say conscientiousness. You know, it's, you know, I'm going to do it my own way. Uh, I don't like this way anyway. These people are whatever. So, um, and then other agreeableness. So, you know, thinking about personality variables, agreeableness is the, the variable of do you like do you, do you have a need to get along with people. Um, uh, Dissenting is kind of tough if you're really agreeable. To be a good doctor, you have to get along with people, teams, dyads, families. So uh, to the extent that you're a little bit more agreeable than normal, you're also going to be a little more agreeable to not dissenting when you should. Now, uh, think about your, your – have everyone been to a graduate seminar in, uh, in the humanities or social science? These people are not agreeable, right? <laughs> They're going to rip apart everything you say before you finish saying it. So uh, that personality <laughs> variable is important, too, to think about. Um, I'd say third, um, maybe extroversion, because to conform, yeah, extroverted people tend to conform a little easier than introverted people. And again, doctors are a little more social than probably uh, uh, your average you know, college professor. Um, openness to experience is a big uh, personality variable that predicts political conservatism versus liberalism. If you're really open to experience, you'll, um, you, know, you might just want to try things for their own sake, try new things. And um, dissenting is uh, new ideas that are dissenting ideas from kind of what you like to do will, will be, will be uh, really likely to come to your mind. Whereas if you like structure, order, uh, predictability, you're going to be low on openness to experience. So being low on openness to experience predicts a little more conservatism. <coughs> so, so um, uh, you know, and so, so the dissenting ideas, the idea that maybe I shouldn't do this, probably is a little less likely for the uh, physician versus the biologist, the PhD biologist. In the same way, um, uh, respect for hierarchy, anyone who's worked in a hospital knows respect for hierarchy. Hierarchy is an important way in which militaries and other hospital type uh, organizations function, but respect for hierarchy can also be undermined, undermining of ethics if the hierarchy sucks. Um, you know, so um, those are some things I see as personality variables in, in doctoring, but then obviously there's stuff specific to being in the Nazi context, like things Tessa talked about with the um, uh, sort of moralization of biological explanation, even if it's pseudoscience. Um, you know, doctors have a pro proclivity for biological explanation, and the Nazi doctrine was explicitly um, salvific by means of biology. And um, there's always something seductive to thinking our science will give us ethics. And um, you can see why doctors might have gone for it, because then, you know, the quintessential doctor is the leader of the country, and you yourself are, as a doctor, thinking of yourself in this um, glorified role, basking in reflected glory, so you imagine why. Uh, by the way, uh, so 50% of doctors were early joiners of the Nazi party, which is an amazing number because almost 50% of the doctors at the time were Jewish, so it's almost like 100% of the non-Jews <laughs> were jumping into the party, <coughs> right, compared to any other profession. <laughs> and um, compared to your average German male who's working, 
the doctors were about seven times more likely to join. So even especially psychiatrists. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. So uh, you could imagine that th there's something really particular to the ideology that attracted the doctors. Uh, other things are, um, I'd say, you know, the Nazi ideology medicalized political conflict. And so I think that's one of the lessons you take. Uh, oftentimes it's very seductive to want to bring politics into the, <laughs> the ethics of doctoring. But you can imagine an uh, authoritarian or totalitarian politics undermining medical ethics, but so could a purely libertarian ideology, right? Imagine your, your entire politics is libertarian that can go into a hospital and make the market the ultimate arbiter of who, who enters into caregiving. So I think that's, uh, that's something you see there too in that particular context. Um, you know, doctors want to fight mortality, right? Nobody goes into medicine because they, they don't care about mortality. And uh, Hitler was offering a sort of symbolic mortality, a regime that will last a thousand years. You know, if you're going to work every day, um, uh, not thinking of your, your, your job as, you know, fighting against uh, sickness and mortality, maybe it's not something that will easily come to mind. Uh, so maybe that was also a vulnerability. And uh, we know that the profession was especially vulnerable, medical profession at the time, because of economic insecurity and competition for patients and things. So I think uh, there's, those are the historical economic reasons that I think combined with the psychological variables. Yeah. Go ahead, Ira, you want to well, you know, I, I would love to hear your thoughts and, and also the thoughts of the panelists on this. I always find it so interesting how uh, we say, oh, you know, doctors joined the Nazi party. I can't believe it. They took the Hippocratic Oath. How could they go and break that oath and join the Nazi party? Uh, and I mean, in one respect, I understand the Hippocratic Oath is, is a, a, a performative statement where you think that it obligates you and therefore, you know, you're breaking some sort of like uh, contractual obligation that you made yourself. But when you think about the uh, efficacy of a verbal declaration versus the, uh, you know, a situationist frame or e even habit formation in, in um, keeping resilience in, 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 your, in your ethical, the <laughs> ethical positions that you would, you would hold despite what would necessarily the environment that you're in, uh, it seems like the oath is kind of like a throwaway almost, where great, they made the oath, but how much of the oath would be actually productive or efficacious given the temperaments that you're mentioning, the habits uh, that physicians had in their professional uh, experiences, and also uh, just the situation that they were in socially and politically. Absolutely, and you know, I think that's an amazing point. So if you think of a declaration as something that's um, uh, factual, deliberative, um, it's propositional. You read about it and you think about it and then you go on with your life. Whereas um, maybe it doesn't filter into your into your habits and the way you you know you form your character. Um, there was one very famous experiment of moral philosophers and whether they were like how often they called their mother compared to the average person, <laughs> or whether they uh, held the door, or, you know, kind of their everyday <laughs> ethics. And uh, you might want to guess whether the, you know they're thinking all day about Kant and Hegel and maybe not Hegel, but uh, <laughs> Kant and Aristotle and Maimonides. And so it turns out they're no they're no more likely to do any of those nice kind things than um, yeah, you know, any other person in similar education, ex age, and so on. So uh, I don't ethical <coughs> deliberation seems to not go very deep unless it's uh, combined with uh, self-cultivation, <coughs> practice, ritual, and other things. So that's a great point. I'm, I'm sorry, Iri, I just want to chime in for one second. Um, I couldn't agree more with what everybody here is saying, right? So declarations are fantastic, and oath, it's, it's great. Obviously, you're putting out there, this is what you, you know, want to be doing, this is what you're committed to. But the way that we're really going to make a difference um, now, moving forward, is by listening to this group of people here and by going home and actually thinking about what they said and then going out in your own lives and using these lessons. Uh, and that's the reason why it's so important to continue talking about this, not just from a historical point of view, but also in terms of the relevance for modern society. How can we use this moving forward to ensure that something like this does not happen again? I'm sorry for stepping on your toes. Iri, go right ahead and no, answer. No problem. So, so I just wanted to add a couple of uh, uh, semi-related points to that, which is, first of all, um, <clears throat> in the early 90s, I worked in, for the Israeli government in Germany, and so I lived there for four and a half years. This was, as I say again, the early 90s, not the 60s, not the 70s, the early 90s. In the early 90s still, uh, children were, uh, it was decided in the school by the end of the fifth grade 
which children were going to go to gymnasium, the regular high school, and which children were going to Volksschule, uh, which were the professional schools. Mm -hmm. So at that point still, the society was so stratified and the respect for certain professions was so high that when, when I had to speak on the phone as a representative of the Israeli government, formally, to some people, if they happened to be doctors, I had to address them in the following way. Herr Professor Dr. Steinert, and if I spoke to the wife of Herr Professor Dr. Steinert, I had to say, Guten Abend, Frau Herr <laughs> Professor Dr. Steinert. <laughs> this is the truth. So, you know, and also, you know, having grown up in Israel uh, in my time, the physicians were still, a lot of them, Jewish German physicians. Yes. And I really, really have a very um, uh, sort of personal experience throughout the years, you know, myself, my family, my parents. I have a very personal experience of, you know, uh, something that doesn't exist anymore in our society, where you couldn't ask a question of the doctor because that was impertinent. Mm -hmm. That was immediately a sign of unbelievable rudeness and one time when I went with a good friend of mine and he asked the doctor a question, the doctor opened the door and said, raus, <laughs> in German, out you go. <laughs> so we have to also uh, uh, kind of take that into account and how well uh, we've been uh, influenced now by the internet and a much more sort of uh, egalitarian Absolutely. view of all kinds of things. Um, and then I also wanted to throw in just a, a mention in terms of what to do about it and how relevant it is today uh, without getting bogged down by particular empirical you know, studies, I will say that we see quite uh, disappointing results for all of those wonderful programs that we have in the schools about anti-bullying and the fact that they're not really effective and we look at our universities uh, and we see um, all kinds of data suggesting that the millennials are very, very interested at an abstract level in all kinds of good things, you know, the, the, the climate control and, and all kinds of other egalitarian issues. They're much less uh, stereo tending to stereotype, but interpersonally, they are much less caring of mm. each other. We have incredibly high rates of sexual assault on campuses by uh, students, against students. We have all kinds of other in, uh, indications that interpersonally they're very narcissistic while uh, abstractly, philosophically, very, and the question is how do we bridge that gap? How do we make the philosophers, you know, act a little more mensch-like mm -hmm. to the person next to them? Absolutely. I think you, you bring up a very good point. Um, historically, there's a very uh, paternalistic aspect to medicine. Um, and particularly in Nazi Germany, we saw earlier, you know, Hitler, the great doctor of the German people. And uh, physicians in Nazi Germany were held uh, to, a, a, you know, a much, in, in a much, much higher regard, uh, which may explain why so many of them joined the Nazi party. Um, and so, you know, I think that that kind of continues today in terms of just the idea that if powerful people are telling you to do something, you know, it's difficult to kind of go against that. And so in Nazi Germany, you had this scientific concept of eugenics, right, which was the idea that, and it, it made a lot of sense at the time. We say pseudoscience now, um, but a little bit that's like Monday morning quarterbacking, right? At the time, that was the best we had. That was, you know, we were working off of real scientific data. We thought this made sense. Um, and we can make a better society. So it's kind of a double whammy. And you took this scientific theory and you were also able to use it for the, within the politicization of medicine. Um, you were, we were able to use science kind of to uh, meet the ideals of national socialism. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of danger there that we can see for everybody, not just physicians, but for everybody, for physicians, for patients, for the general population. 
Um, and so, you know, uh, propaganda, which I know is something um, that Ira, you've discussed uh, in, in other instances, you know, the economic burden of the unfit, kind of the, the use of doctors as agents of, of death for the state. So what lessons can we learn about the way in which medicine is perceived in society and, and the dangers that are inherent in assuming that healers uh, are above kind of uh, some of these things? They couldn't possibly kill people because, you know, they took an oath. They, they took an oath, so how could this happen? Um, what does it mean today in terms of the safety for patients um, in this complex multicultural society that we live in? Go ahead, Arit. So let me just get this out of the way because you're answering questions <laughs> again. So, so um, I come from a very stoic family and a very private family, and it is really, really not my uh, usual thing to uh, speak about personal experiences. It's much easier to address things in a general sense. But I decided that today is a very special forum, and in, in this context, I wanted to tell you uh, what made this topic uh, become so personally meaningful to me. So what made it so meaningful to me was my uh, experiences around my mother's uh, end of life care. My mother was a Holocaust survivor um, and she was the most optimistic, positive, upbeat person I've ever met. She was 21 years old when the Holocaust broke, when, when the Nazis invaded, in fact, uh, right into her town across the river San into Przemysl, which is now in the Ukraine, on the, uh, on the border with the Ukraine. And uh, so she lived for six years under Nazi regime until liberation in 1945, survived all by herself, uh, the only survivor of her family, two parents that were in their, in their early 50s and seven siblings. Uh, the way that my mother survived and the way that she lived all her life afterwards as I observed it was her, her adaptation was really being very resilient, very competent, I can do it all by myself whenever she had a terrible health crisis or something terrible happened in the family, which a few times it did. She would say to me, I tell myself in my head, I, let's imagine that I'm in the war by myself. And she drew strength from that to face whatever she needed to. She was also very optimistic, always smiling, met the world with a great deal of optimism and generosity. And she said, that's what saved my life. And I saw it indeed. I saw how people were always inclined to, uh, you know, drawn to her and drawn to be helpful to her because that's the way she was and that's the way uh, they were back to her. It was particularly painful, therefore, um, to see this woman have the most uh, horrific death in, a, in, a, in, a, in what was really the ultimate failure of empathy towards her and towards uh, the people who loved her, us. And the reason why I find it so important to talk about is because, you know, there was a very important, uh, uh, this is a, a small tangent. Last week came the um, report of the Lancet Commission on Palliative Care and Pain Relief, uh, speaking about the need to bridge the abyss in access to palliative care and pain relief all over the world because there are many places where it's almost inaccessible to people but it is also the case that in many countries, high income countries like uh, Israel where my mother uh, lived and, and other places, uh, I'm sure here, uh, where good uh, medical services exist and nonetheless access to palliative and pain relief services is still problematic. And even places where um, these services, pa good palliative and pain relief services exist, there is often a very vehement and passionate uh, disagreement about um, how to use them at end of life care. So my mother died in one of Israel's premier hospitals, a hospital that we were very familiar with because of many previous health crises, a hospital that saved her life in many previous times. But on this occasion as she was, uh, what happened was my mother was shy of three days shy of being nine, of 93 years old when she fell at home and broke her hip. A very common uh, accident in the old, old, and a very common uh, uh, 
cause of death. So it wasn't some rare disease that my mother was dying from. She was completely lucid and completely with it. And so because of her other health conditions, a consultation was called with a cardiologist and an anesthesiologist who told her she might not be able to breathe on her own after surgery. At that point, my mother said, no, thank you. I've had enough. And she decided to die. Um, however, no palliative care and no pain relief care was offered. And therefore, uh, when I came, I arrived uh, in, from the States directly to the hospital and I saw her in the night, she was, uh-uh. In the morning, it was terrible. And when I asked the physician to give her some palliative care, he said to me, those were his words, um, there is, and she was having a great difficulty breathing. There is no pain medication for breathing. We don't give any, anything for difficulty breathing. And there's no mercy killing in this hospital. <laughs> and so I said, I'm not asking for mercy killing. I'm asking for palliative care for, to help her. And uh, he got very agitated and uh, said, I have my license, I have my faith, and I have my uh, studies, and that's the way it's going to be. And at that point, you know, um, this is really a prime example of what the Lancet uh, Commission <coughs> uh, speaks of when they talk about ophiophobia, which is a combination of prejudice and misinformation about the appropriate use of medication in end-of-life care. So what I'm saying is uh, there are a lot of things that go into um, into end-of-life care, uh, which go even beyond the guidelines that are written somewhere, because Israel does have, does participate in uh, agreements that uh, member states participate in with WHO, and does have all kinds of things in place. And still, there is a lot that we need to do in order to, as a society, make it uh, a very high priority for people, for multidisciplinary, um, groups to get together that include uh, faith-based um, leaders, uh, lawmakers, uh, all kinds of multidisciplinary other participants as well as uh, representatives of the public to decide how we want to live and how we want to die and to not only have guidelines that are written somewhere and not only have physicians, individual physicians responsible for it because that leaves them too much in charge and their own interpretations, right or wrong, too much, uh, uh, too much power mm -hmm. in individuals' hands, we also need to have extremely transparent uh, uh, structures and procedures in hospitals that allow patients and their loved ones to access these structures immediately because you know as your loved one is struggling for air and writhing in the bed in terrible pain, you're not exactly in the best position to be advocating and to be trying to figure out uh, how the system works. And if anybody was supposed to be competent at it, it's someone like me. So I think it's incredibly important to make it a very high priority mm. so that other people have it a little bit easier. Mm. We also, I just wanted to add one sentence. I also don't totally hold it against that physician particularly. I think that what he said reflected where he was at. My studies, my faith, my license. Right. He didn't mm -hmm. have enough training his faith somehow was not, did not offer him an integrated view of how to deal with end-of-life care without it being killing. And his license, he was afraid to lose it if my mom would stop breathing, if he gives her something. And it is our responsibility to make it so that the people that we put in charge of such responsibilities as physicians at the end of life, or physicians in general, that we also provide all of those other things in place for them to counter those potential risks that mm -hmm. their jobs involve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's, uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, I think I see, the, I see a, a direct lesson there too for the, uh, for the Nuremberg Code in the sense of, um, as, as, as uh, 
as you mentioned, it was written by lawyers and for as a legal decision. And uh, oftentimes, the the worst perpetrators of uh, dehumanization are the doctors themselves, as we saw from the from the presentation. So, um, similar to your story, you need thir third parties to create uh, moral outrage and policing things. You need committees with lawyers and uh, religious leaders and um, lay persons. But also, um, there's, a, there's a deep psychological reason for that, which is that whenever people do something um, wrong or evil, it always feels good. It always feels like they're doing good. So it's very hard to find someone doing something evil like a psychopath, like a Bernie Madoff or something, you know? <laughs> Scheming and thinking deeply and then enjoying watching people squirm. That's like very small percentage of humans. Most people, like, like the Germans, um, like this doctor who didn't really think very much, we're, we're doing things because they thought they're doing the right thing. So our, our sense of conscience is often the worst guide to, what we're, to whether we're doing something evil. Um, and so a third party can be a corrective. Um, and lawyers are often that take that role in the, in the clinical realm. Um, also, uh, evil, evil uh, or you know, what people often call sin, is, is very ordinary. It feels very ordinary. And my favorite example of this is uh, the poet W.H. Auden, who was, um, was, was teaching kindergarten one day. And uh, he went up to the kids and he said, Hey kids, you know uh, what does the devil look like? And they were like, "Oh, you know, he has big horns and he's he's really scary." He said, "No, it's me. It looks like me." And all the kids got scared, and you know, they didn't hire him again next year. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, the, the the deep the deep uh, philosophical psychological point is that um, when people do things um, that are wrong, they do them by a little bit. They take a little bit off the edges. They cut corners. They s they protect their own ego. They they have find plausible deniability in their community. With, their, with the people they're interacting with. And those are all the small things that wind up um, creating the kind of things we were, we were hearing about today. And um, self-deception is a deep part of human nature. So all those things are really why you need third parties to, to critique. Right, and, and structures that enforce accountability, you know. So I, I, I need to say how sorry I am that that happened to you and your mom at the end of her life. What a terrible, terrible thing to have to be part of. True. And there are solutions. So I developed and ran the clinical ethics consult service at Montefiore and Einstein for 35 years. Early in my practice, a woman decided she did not want to be intubated, and that was coming up. And we all agreed, and her family agreed, and we brought in palliative care. <coughs> and her primary physician said to her, and when you're gasping for breath, won't you want us to intubate you? And the palliative care person said, of course you won't be gasping for breath. We'll control your symptoms so you die comfortably. So we can do that now. We can say to families where there's conflict, talk to me about that conflict. SIT, I have a little acronym, STADA. Sit down, get everybody in the room, the family, the daughter, and say, what would mama want? Or what does mama say she wants? And then, tell me about mama if mama can't. What are her values? What would she want? Admire. Thank you for coming and helping us make this hard decision. And then finally discuss the medicine and ask what should happen. And that happens openly and transparently, run by bioethics in very close cooperation with palliative care open to everyone, documented in the chart, keep the lawyers away from the process. Lawyers don't do well playing roles in which the values of the patient and family and not the needs of the hospital must be paramount. I'm a lawyer, keep the lawyers away from hard bioethics issues. But this should never, ever, ever happen. And I think in American hospitals, big teaching hospitals now, we've made it 
not the norm, but an aberration. But how hard for you. Thank you so much for sharing that story, um, first of all. Um, and I, I think that one of the points that we can take away, one of the lessons that we can learn is that, you know, we need to do a better job of educating people, uh, not just on step one from a medical perspective, you know, first you intubate, then whatever. We need to work on, you know, their moral ethos uh, that's going to guide them in situations like that. And so um, this no, I have to interrupt you. We don't want the moral ethos of the doctor mm -hmm. to guide what happens. Exactly. We don't, we don't want that. Mm. Right. We want the moral ethos of the patient and family to guide what happens. Right. And once the, some people who do bioethics swoop in and announce what should happen, mm. I don't do that because I'm not the one whose values matter. Right. Exactly. So that doctor should not have been in a position to enforce his values on the patient and family. Sorry for interrupting. No, feel free, that's fine. I was going to address this question to Ira because he's a medical educator. Yep, Ira, it's on you now. Um, so we do have to educate physicians. And we do have to talk about this. And, and you know, 99% of the time um, when I speak to anybody about this topic, they assume that I'm going to talk about Mengele and they assume that I'm going to talk about medical experimentation. But as we've just learned, there's a lot more to this field than just medical experimentation. Um, and so in the interest of kind of, you know, what can we learn? How, what can we do with these lessons? Oftentimes in medical schools today, the Holocaust is, only explicitly mentioned in the curriculum when we're talking about the Nuremberg Code. So are there ways that we can use these lessons as we're educating, you know, future generations of leaders in healthcare, whether those leaders are going to be, um, you know, physicians, whether they're going to be nurses, whether they're going to be public policy makers, whatever it is, what is our responsibility uh, from an educational perspective um, and how can we draw on the lessons of the Holocaust? So, so this is a this is I think the hardest question. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. And I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure whatever I'm going to say, we're going to have comments on, which I think is is important too, uh, especially since uh, we all have a lot of experience. Uh, and even if uh, I may have an answer, which I'm not saying I do, but even if I have an answer, the answer always should be informed by consensus and unity. And uh, the one thing I, I do want to say, though, in, in terms of medical ethics in general, is. Uh, there is a collaborative care team and there is a, uh, a medical provider patient relationship uh, and this that gets really tough and really tricky, right? Because in one respect, patient autonomy is a, a first among equals. Um, however, physicians also have a professional and a personal uh, moral integrity that they need to come to terms with as well. If, if they always subjected themselves to the whims of patients, and I'm not saying they are whims, but what they perceive as whims, that's also not going to be a productive relationship as well. So there's always that balance between um, being authoritative and not authoritarian um, as, as, a, as a medical provider and as a physician. Um, but with regards to the Holocaust, so, so this is the now what question. Great, we know that this is important. We just had, what, an hour and a half? Two hours? <laughs> Two hours on, 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 on recognizing that this should be taught. The question is where? So medical schools in general, uh, they're, they're professional schools. They teach competencies and program objectives in order to make someone uh, clinically proficient in order to be able to do their job well. Uh, they don't have a lot of time really uh, invested in uh, teaching of history or theology or philosophy. Uh, I mean, not to put Omar on the spot, but. I'm sure there's a reason why you got an MTS and a PhD in addition to your MD degree, uh, <laughs> realizing maybe that the MD degree wasn't going to give you the philosophy and the theology that you needed. Uh, so with regards to what you can put into a medical school yeah. curriculum, uh, you can't just add and you can't just expand and say, oh, this is important, this is important. Uh, we're kind of relying on the fact that students will be self-directed in the respect of we'll teach them certain clinical and, and um, medical competencies, but they should be able to be well-rounded individuals who care about values and so forth and whatever. What you could do, though, 
uh, is look at the Holocaust as um, not a topic-oriented uh, subject, but setting a contextual frame for a skills-based orientation. That also gets difficult. Uh, the reason why it gets difficult is because there's two types of people, well, I'm sure there's many, but I'll put it in this term. There's two types of people uh, that it's very difficult to learn from. Uh, the first are moral saints. Uh, when people are so good that you can't relate to them, it's easy to say, whoa, that is not me. Uh, that's great, but uh, there's nothing I can really do about it. Uh, the second type is the moral deplorable, is that person is so bad that I don't need to learn anything from that person because that person's not me. Uh, now, Tessa did a really good job showing that uh, learning about the Holocaust shouldn't be in the frame of moral deplorables, there is a relatability there. But then the question is, are we just teaching the past or are we teaching uh, a frame to talk about the present and the future? So I mean, I have three places where I think it could fit really well, uh, which isn't necessarily in the clinical frame, but I do think your case book would fit the clinical side of education. But in how the physician or, or, or any medical uh, provider could then uh, look at uh, his or her role as a professional in social context or in social discourse. So the first is, and I'm not going to mention it a, a lot, but the whole genetics, right? Genetic engineering uh, and uh, genetic technology today, even if it's very different in terms of the methods and the science of the eugenics movement, the social implications and the philosophy and the methodologies used to think about the issues of genetics, we've been thinking about that for a very long time. So if we looked at the Holocaust or what led to the Holocaust as a frame for how people were responding and asking certain questions, then in your genetics courses in medical school, you can not have to start from scratch of, oh, how would you think about it? You can look at what's already been pr uh, productive or learn from history in order to look at the present and the, and the future. Uh, the second is with social media. And I know that sounds crazy for, for to talk about it in a medical school, but I think especially today, uh, it's actually quite important. So today we have this issue of uh, our news and our information is very democratized, which means that no longer do people necessarily go through uh, uh, newspapers or specific news channels, but they get a lot of stuff on the internet. Uh, and the onus then becomes on the viewer of what is true, what is alternative, what is this, what is that. I mean, I can go on forever, but you get my point. Uh, and we're having a lot of struggles here understanding the value of veracity, or uh, uh, the, the responsibility and accountability of, of, of being knowledgeable in certain areas, not only to, for my own personal knowledge, but how do I talk to a patient who's read a bunch of stuff on the internet? Right? Uh, in the 1930s, there was also a new media that disseminated information democratically to a public where the public also now needed to be responsible somewhat of knowing what was facts, what was news, and what was political ideology. That happened in Germany in the 30s. The radio was used as an ideological tool to push the party, right? So if we learn through history to know how information is disseminated to the public so we can respond to it when our patients come and say, I got this off the internet, that's also a good frame both historically but to understand context and skills. Uh, the third is the issue with regards to the uh, medical healthcare system at large. Uh, today, as much as we love talking about the patient-physician relationship, and it's, it's a great relationship, I'm not, not bashing it. Not as great as, you know, <laughs> my marital relationship, but I, 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 it is also sacred, uh, is that that relationship is being eroded as much as, we want, as, as much as we're saying it's a value by uh, government, insurance, economics, uh, and uh, the, pr the, the professionality of this patient physician relationship. Uh, that's a problem that we're all trying to deal with, of how do you not dehumanize when you only have 12 minutes to talk to someone and you gotta use your computer to write everything down and uh, everything else. That also isn't new. That happened in the Weimar Republic. There was a, a, an erosion of the patient-physician relationship because the way uh, uh, healthcare was disseminated, the influence of insurance companies in, in determining which patients could see by which doctors and so forth, how things were paid for, that if we can learn through history of how to uh, approach the present and future, then the Holocaust becomes really relevant. It's not a category unto itself that, oh, become a doctor and also learn this, but it allows us to say, how can this make us better doctors? So that's how I think it should be integrated in a, in a, in a medical school system. 
So um, I'm sure everybody wants to respond to that. However, uh, in the interest of time and making sure that we have some time. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I have to also manage the clock here. Um, so in the, I'm sure all of these lovely people would like to speak to you. So um, I am going to ask for your uh, final thoughts on this topic. I originally had a question I was going to ask you. What you guys are going to say is way better than what I would ask. So um, basically 70 years after the doctor's trial and the publication of the Nuremberg Code, where are we? Where do we need to go? What, what, what can we say? What can we do um, to make sure that we honor the past, uh, we reflect upon the past, and moving forward, we protect the future? And I'm going to go down the line to make it easy. So Omar, uh, go right ahead, please. Uh, sure. Well, I guess one, um, some of these uh, lessons that we mentioned, one I take from it is um, the conflation of uh, our science and our ethics, where we, uh, we think we can determine our, our, our ethics from looking at our science, which is, is really hard to do and uh, very easy to do in a, in a kind of ideological context, whether totalitarian or otherwise. Um, the other is uh, the politicization of the, the guild or the profession's ethics. I think they have some in, in inherent integrity to them, whether it's non-maleficence, do no harm, uh, you know, um, beneficence, social justice. They're, in, they're intrinsic to the profession they've been developed over time, but when you have outside political ideologies infect that, you, you do have a lot of sort of corruption. You see that in the Soviet Union as well. You see that in various different countries. Um, and then I guess uh, the other lesson we mentioned about needing third parties to oversee hospitals and doctors. Um, I would include lawyers because of their contribution to human rights legislation and the understanding of how uh, courts and governments work, as well as laypersons and, um, and physicians and representatives. But uh, for the reasons mentioned about anytime you have a group of people with similar interests, you're going to have group polarization and uh, groupthink. So you need, che you need checks and balances on that, um, just like our, our, how our government is organized by the founders. Uh, fourth, I think. Um, you know, the dignity of the individual sticks out. Uh, a lot of these things could have been objected to if there was a strong emphasis on uh, the inviolability or deontological rules against killing and harming. So those things come out of the tradition of, of the West and uh, Athens and Jerusalem. And that is a great lesson that I take from this because without that, you really do slide into the social organism being pri uh, prior to the individual uh, and uh, utilitarian forms of ethics where killing might be obligated to to, you know, to help other, others other than the individual. And uh, you see that also in other societies outside of Germany. Um, you know, the way China does bioethics, um, uh, honor killings, you know, why, why families rationalize chaining their psychotic relative to a bed or putting them in a cage, um, all by the same rationales that you see expressed in the uh, German society, but without any emphasis on the dignity of the individual. And then um, I'd say... Since uh, I think in the last 70 years also you see a corrective against paternalism, but you also you see a corrective against extreme forms of uh, individualist autonomy, expressive individualism going into medicine as well. Because if you imagine what would a, um, a purely uh, autonomy as a primary value hospital look like, a libertarian hospital, it would basically be a place where you, you, know, you, got to, you run to the emergency room and you say, I want to kill myself, and the doctor says, well, let's express your you know, unique needs and autonomy. Here's some cyanide. Or, um, you know, <laughs> I've rationally decided, like, you know, li little Woody it's Allen in, uh, in Annie Hall, th the universe is expanding. I want to, you know, it's not worth it. The doctor would say, well, let's just get that autonomy on the table for you. <laughs> and so, you know, the health is an enor a normative concept. It's an intrinsically normative concept. It's not the same as autonomy. So what it means to be healthy and to flourish is something separate from expressing your desires and your wishes. <laughs> so the doctor's obligation and, the, and, a, and a hospital's obligation is to m maximize the individual in community and their flourishing. So that's something <coughs> richer than just autonomy. So, uh, you know, because sometimes we have overcorrected from the Nuremberg Code and the Nazi era towards um, anything goes. So I, I take those as the lessons. So really there's not much to add after Omar, but uh, I, would, uh, I would like to add uh, a couple of things, and that is that as someone who teaches and is uh, actually a very important perspective that I get is being the wife of my husband, who is a physics professor at Columbia University, 
So he gets to teach the medical students a course that many of them find as one of the most difficult obstacles in their profession, in their professional development. So I come across a lot of very, very strange things that students mm -hmm. do in their desperate attempt to get through and become doctors. Some of those things are very unethical things, which again makes me think very much about our very, very competitive society in which, as you say, uh, doctors and, uh, and others, but let's say doctors right now, have enormous amounts of material to learn and to get through just in order to acquire the competencies and the skills that they need to. But in some ways, we are overloading them so much with that that there's no room left for ethical development and for an emphasis on that. And so, you know, we, um, we run the risk uh, again, which was pointed out by Yuda Bauer, a very uh, famous Holocaust researcher in Jerusalem, who said the Nazi doctors were highly educated barbarians, meaning that these were highly educated people using their highly sophisticated knowledge in cruel and inhumane ways. Uh, and I think that, and even sometimes in cruel and inhumane experiments, which were aimed at increasing knowledge and medical knowledge, and they did. Uh, someone mentioned here before the hypothermia experiments. These are experiments that are essentially the basis of, the basis of what we know about these things uh, very much. So very important lessons that were learned at a terrible cost. And I think the whole issue raises for us the question how to integrate still an ethical emphasis into the education of physicians in particular and healthcare providers in general. Thank you. Oh. So I'd like to take a slightly different tack and address the last part of the remarks on the healthcare system. It seems to me that the most important lesson for me from the Holocaust and physicians is that the obligation of physicians is to patients and families and not to the state. I find myself in America at this moment alienated from the state. And it seems to me that the goal of medicine has got to be to ensure that everyone has access to health care. And any actions that undercut that basic commitment to health care for all are, I think, unethical. I found the discussions in Congress deeply disgusting. I have the same problem with present discussions about tax relief. I am out of sympathy with the state. And therefore, it seems to me, I know there are complaints about the 17-minute visit because my geriatric colleagues tell me they can't get their patients' clothes off <laughs> in 17 minutes. There are <laughs> problems with longitudinal studies for pay for performance. But basically, America has a decent health care system for those of us connected and a terrible health care system for those who are not. And that, it seems to me, is the overriding lesson of the Holocaust that medicine has to be true to patients and families. Thank you. Well, I don't know what I can say in answer to that. Of course, I agree. Coming from Israel, working as a family physician for Kupat Cholim Klalit as a public health uh, provider, not, a pri not in private practice at all, 
35 years being a physician already, I can honestly say that I'm proud of the system that I work for. We have national health insurance where we are one of the, uh, I, I can honestly say that every single citizen of Israel has health insurance. We might not all be, will be able to get nose jobs and breast implants uh, you know, covered, but if we have serious medical issues, every citizen in Israel is covered. So I can actually, um, I'm proud of that. Palliative medicine has improved immensely. Um, I am very deeply sad, of course, to hear this, your personal story, but I would hope, I would like to think, and I think I have about 2,000 patients on my list, I do not hear any more stories like that of, you know, an orthopedic surgeon uh, saying that this is my principles, my faith, and I cannot help my patient. I would like to believe that that doesn't happen. Uh, it certainly shouldn't. Palliative medicine is being learned by physicians and students, of course, more or, uh, all over the world. And I think, basically, I'm not a philosopher and I don't believe in talking, I believe in doing. And I think that the only way, or what I take home, is that we have to teach. We have to teach humanities to medical students. They can also read books and, and talk about art and talk about feelings and not only anatomy, physiology, and physics. Don't even remind me. <laughs> you know what it's like doing physics in Hebrew when you don't know Hebrew? Oh. <laughs> Very traumatic, but... I seriously would recommend, I mean, the only way to do it is to teach. We can't, unfortunately, teach doctors too much. We are not, we are unteachable. We know everything. But students, there's still hope. And I think that we have to include it into, we, as it, I think it's getting more accepted to, to introduce humanities into the medical curriculum, as, even if it's so crowded. There's a limit as to how much, uh, you, know, you can you can read and an learn anatomy from the books. You cannot read. You cannot, cannot learn humanities or ethics from the books. You have to have role models who perform correctly, and you have to teach. You have to talk to students. Our class, we've been doing it for 15 years on medicine and the Holocaust. Uh, we have had years. We have had minimal attendance, and we've gone ahead and done the class. And now we have to get permission because we've got too many students who want to come. Mm. And I'm very happy to say that this year we have half Arab students and half Jewish students. So it's wonderful and we have the most fantastic uh, course. And every year the students say they don't understand why it's not compulsory. Of course the dean and whatever, the, the politics behind it. Uh, you know, why do we have to get permission for somebody who wants to come and listen to what we have to say? But the only way to do this is to teach and to talk, and it depends on the person, the people involved. You need somebody who's passionate about it to do it. Thank you. Yeah, again, I, I, after this, I, I really don't have much to add. I would just say, when, when with regards to teaching, there's there's a teaching about something, and there's teaching to do something, uh, and we see this in clinical practice. I mean, in, in teaching clinical skills versus teaching uh, basic sciences, let's say. Um, but when you're looking at ethics. The teaching has to focus on teaching how do uh, how do how can students uh, engage in thoughtful action that turns into repetitive practice, which becomes a habit, which becomes part of their identity uh, formation. If you can if you could figure out how to do that, then you've done great. But until then, uh, it's really up to not only just us on the panel, but literally everybody here to show uh, society, medical schools, and medical students, and future doctors. Uh, that this is something that's not only important, but uh, essential if we're, if we're all going to be successful and flourish. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. I have to say, uh, this was a truly a fantastic conversation. Um, programs like this are only possible because of people like this who are so committed and so dedicated to the cause. Um, and I think it is both a wonderful way to commemorate the anniversary of Kristallnacht um, by listening to everything that everybody here had to say, um, but then, as Ira said, to go out and um, make a difference and, and teach in whatever way that is, um, whether it's formal or informal. Um, whatever we can do, I think we have a responsibility. 
Um, and I would just like to thank everybody here so much um, for participating. If you just let the panelists get off the stage, then you can go up and uh, talk to them all you want. Um, we're not going to do a formal questions. We're just going to, after everybody kind of gets off the stage. Um, and there are also refreshments um, outside. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone.